According to the Mayo Clinic, only 3% of Americans meet the following simple criteria for a healthy lifestyle. In an industry focused on treating sick people, too many healthy people makes for a really bad business plan. But the foundation for good health is the choices that you make every day. Having said that, what are those choices? Our gimmick for good health is that there is no gimmick, but there is definitely a workable plan. The current healthcare system isn't about health, wellness, and longevity. It's crisis intervention and revenue generation. Lee and I came together with this passion for better nutrition, proper exercise, the importance of sleep and community engagement. I realized that something that we haven't done at the Chris Quinn Company YouTube channel is give an overview of what we believe are the most important strategies for good health. Spoiler alert, there is no magic bullet quick fix, sorry. Good health comes from making an array of good decisions. I know it isn't sexy. You've seen the clickbait. Eliminate this one food. Eat this one food. Do this one secret exercise. Eliminate beans. Don't touch lectins. Give me a break. Here's our gimmick. There is no gimmick. But embrace an array of simple strategies and the likelihood is that you will massively improve your health, reduce your risk of disease, and optimize your body weight. According to the Mayo Clinic, only 3% of Americans meet the following simple criteria for a healthy lifestyle. These are 150 minutes per week of moderate or vigorous exercise, a better than average diet eating the top 40% of the healthy eating index, a body fat percentage less than 20% for men and 30% for women, and not smoking. Only 3% of us meet these simple criteria it is my wish that the medical profession would focus more on this low-hanging fruit to get people really healthy. As humans, we like little or no effort and simple silver bullet solutions. It just doesn't work that way. There is no one thing we need to do to be lean and healthy. First, as a general statement, you need to take responsibility for your health. I work in mainstream healthcare and it certainly has its place. There are almost no incentives in place for the healthcare system to educate you on how to attain really good, robust health. For example, most primary care docs are quick to send you for a screening mammogram or a prostate-specific antigen test, and yet it is highly doubtful that they will ever talk to you about dietary changes that could help you prevent breast and prostate cancer in the first place. Heart disease is another example. About 28% of the U.S. adult population has been prescribed a statin but how many have been counseled on the merits of the cholesterol-lowering and cardioprotective benefits of a plant-predominant diet? Sadly, there are just no financial incentives built into the healthcare system to get people healthy. In an industry focused on treating sick people, too many healthy people makes for a really bad business plan. In the U.S., spending over $4 trillion per year on healthcare, about 80% of the expenditure goes towards managing chronic disease which is mostly lifestyle based and most of that is due to poor nutrition. Ranked 47th in the world for life expectancy and spending more than 50% per person than the next highest country, which is Switzerland, we aren't getting a very good return on our investment. In fairness, US healthcare is great at making diagnoses and intervening in illness with medications and surgeries when needed, but when it comes to producing robust good health, it just isn't happening. You may have heard of the traditional Okinawans with more people living to 110 years old than anywhere else on earth, they were lean and healthy without access to modern pharmaceuticals or tests. There were no CAT scanners or modern surgical suites anywhere to be found, and yet they lived long, healthy, robust lives. The next step in the path to good health is taking responsibility for your health. I'm not saying that you shouldn't see a doctor when a problem arises, but the foundation for good health is the choices that you make every day. Having said that, what are those choices? First and foremost, clean up your diet. If you pay attention at all to what the internet says about what comprises a good diet, you may falsely come to the conclusion that there is no consensus on this matter. The truth is there actually is a lot of consensus, but clickbait thrives on controversy and not on consensus. Internet influencers aside, what do the true authorities on nutrition agree upon? I'm talking about the guys in academic centers doing hardcore research 
that are too busy publishing scientific data rather than trying to garner YouTube views. As summarized by Dr. Christopher Gardner of Stanford University and a preeminent researcher on nutrition, here are four things that virtually anybody credible agrees upon. Eat more whole foods, eat more vegetables, reduce refined grains, reduce added sugar. You won't get any argument from us on this. Dr. Gardner suggests that 75% of nutritional issues would just go away if we all did those four things. According to this article from the American Medical Association, a whopping 42% of calories consumed in the U.S. are refined carbohydrates. That's things like white sugar and white flour. No nutritional scientist on earth is going to claim that these are good for us. Even whole food plant-based vegans and carnivores agree on that. No wonder carbs get a bad rap. Go on a low-carb diet and eliminate those junk carbs, and not surprisingly, people will drop weight and possibly feel better. Often, junk carbs are combined with high fat and salt. That's a combination that doesn't exist in nature and lights up our brains to eat way beyond our caloric needs. People don't understand that junk food carbs are very different from healthy whole food carbs. As Dr. Greger has said, jelly beans and kidney beans are completely different. Replace those junk carbs with whole foods and you will be better off. The food can taste really good, but won't put your brain's reward centers into an uncontrolled frenzy. At Crisco & Company, we advocate a whole food plant-based diet. In a nutshell, that means eat plants, mostly in their unprocessed form. That means fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, nuts, and seeds. Keep junk food as low as possible. The evidence suggests to us that less animal-based food is better than more, and that from a health perspective, zero is probably best. This is a subject of other videos, but as a sliver of the available evidence, consider this. The Adventist Health Study has demonstrated that the fewer animal products consume, the less common both obesity and diabetes become. The large European Epic Panacea study has corroborated this. In the Adventist 2 study, vegans had the lowest rates of type 2 diabetes and were the only group that on average had a normal body mass index. And the difference was not small. Vegan women were almost 40 pounds lighter than the omnivorous women. Both diabetes and obesity are modern-day plagues that could largely be mitigated by the widespread adoption of a whole food plant-based diet. To be clear, going vegan and eliminating animal products in and of itself does not ensure that you will be better off. If you just replace meat with vegan junk food, you won't be better off. Reduce or cut out the meat and backfill your diet with fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, nuts and seeds, and then you will see results. If you're reluctant to drop meat from your diet, go easy on it. I suggest no more than three four ounce servings weekly. But why, you may ask, do people seem to do so well with the recent carnivore craze? Eating nothing but meat, people lose weight and they feel better. Doesn't that prove that meat should be the cornerstone of our diet? No. It just shows that eliminating 42% of the calories that people eat from junk carbs is really bad for your health. Just as sugar and flour are refined foods, so are processed oils. From a health perspective, olive and canola are probably the best, but don't forget that oils are the most calorie dense foods on earth at 4,000 calories per pound. If you're trying to manage your weight, you need to cut these out or at least consume them very sparingly. It is common to wonder about supplements. The mistake that people make is believing that supplements can replace a sound diet when nothing is able to do that. There are hundreds of different supplements available with marketers pitching why you should take them. Are you supposed to down hundreds of pills daily? Why any one supplement over all the others? There are sparing few that have any scientific veracity. If you're not consuming meat, vitamin B12 is absolutely essential. A year's supply for the two of us costs about $15. In the days of old, it was easy to get enough vitamin B12 by just drinking untreated water. Up to 30% of the meat-eating population may be deficient in B12 because the ability to absorb B12 declines with age. It's not a bad idea to have your levels checked after the age of 50, whether you're vegan or not. Unless getting plenty of regular sunshine exposure, most of us will benefit from a vitamin D supplement. Most people will need about 2,000 international units daily 
which is also very cheap. You may need a bit more. Get your blood level checked once in a while. There are very few other supplements worth considering, but these are beyond the scope of this introductory template. These include the long chain omega-3 fatty acids, DHA and EPA, iodine, and maybe zinc, but I will leave these discussions for another day. From a health perspective, nothing else is mandatory. Save your money. Next is exercise. There's no getting around it. We need to do some. But how much and what type? Standard recommendations are to do 150 minutes of moderate exercise per week or 75 minutes of vigorous exercise weekly or some combination of the two. 150 minutes of exercise reduces mortality by 7% compared to doing nothing. This is just a bit over 21 minutes per day. If you cannot spare about 20 minutes a day to be moderately active, there's something wrong with your priorities. Walking for 60 minutes per week only drops mortality by 3%. So 150 minutes is better. Is more than that better yet? Walking 300 minutes per week drops mortality by 14% and 400 minutes drops it by 24%. Apparently there's not enough people exercising more than that to have any firm data beyond this level of exercise. So more does seem to be better, but keep in mind, it isn't really that hard to rack up the minutes. In the summer, I spend two hours each week just pushing the lawn more. If I go on a couple of 45 to 60 minute walks with Joyce and Buddy twice a week, that's about 240 minutes right there. Throw on a couple of 15 to 20 minutes of walking at work a couple of times a week and it keeps adding up. Weekend bike rides in the summer and shoveling snow in the winter, they all count. General physical activity aside, if you want to maximize functionality, we strongly recommend strength training. Is cardio exercise good for you? Sure it is. But keep in mind that the thing that will really keep you out of the nursing home isn't the ability to run a marathon, but basic physical strength to perform the activities of daily living, like getting up out of a chair or lifting up a bag of groceries. That comes from building and retraining strength for as long as you possibly can. The best way to do so comes from a structured program with the intention of getting stronger. Wandering from exercise machine to exercise machine at the gym without a plan is better than nothing but having a structured program to get stronger is definitely better. Many years ago, I was on a path to become a pro bodybuilder. I lifted heavy weights and I got pretty strong. I realize now that I probably went too heavy too often, at times using risky technique, leaving me with chronic injuries. For the last few years, up until late last summer, I'd been doing too much cardio and too much excessive high rep weight training with lighter weights. I was in great shape but when we moved about a year ago, we did most of the move ourselves, and I realized I wasn't nearly as strong as I used to be. I read a book by Mark Ripito called Starting Strength. A few of the finer points in his book I disagree with, but basically I agree with his major premise that the focus of strength training should be primarily on normal human movement patterns. Squatting down, picking things up, putting something overhead, pushing away from ourselves and pulling ourselves up. Squats, deadlifts, overhead presses, bench presses, and pull-ups. Sprinkle in a few isolation moves if you like, but cover these basics. If you have physical limitations, there are usually workarounds and alternatives. My shoulders are trashed from years of bad bench press form and by just getting older. The barbell bench press hurts, so instead I mostly use dumbbells, which aren't too bad and I can get a great workout in. By focusing on basic moves like that, trying to get stronger within weeks, my muscles were filling out and I was definitely stronger. And by the way, I was eating no animal products at all and obviously getting sufficient protein. Although lifting weights traditionally has been the realm of young men, the truth is that older people need it more than they do. The body can respond to strength training remarkably well at any age. It doesn't matter that you may be really weak. All the more reason to start. If all you can lift is a broomstick, then start there. Mr. Ripito has stated on his podcast that he would rather train Tom Brady's mother than Tom Brady. It would be easier to induce huge strength gains and increase functionality in his mom. Whereas for an elite athlete like Brady, any performance increments as the quarterback would be fractional at best. Another excellent book is The Barbell Prescription, which is about using careful strength training as a medical intervention for better health in older adults. 
I throw in a bit of basic stretching exercise a few times a week. The goal is to maintain flexibility and not be a contortionist. I do a few stretches for hamstrings, quads, and shoulders, usually after a workout when I'm warmed up. By the way, don't forget to like and subscribe. Joyce and I spend a lot of time on these videos, even though we have significant other demands on our time, so we would really appreciate if you could help us out by hitting like and subscribe. In a nutshell, my program is general physical activity slash cardio, strength training, and a bit of flexibility work. I find it enjoyable, and my hope is that it will keep me healthy and independent for years to come. I turned 65 within less than a week. In my work as a radiologist, it never ceases to amaze me how unhealthy and decrepit many people are that are younger than me. Most of this is due to lifestyle, and it just doesn't need to be this way. Sleep is another crucial piece of the puzzle, and sleep is a subject near and dear to my heart for reasons that I will explain shortly. In his fascinating book, Why We Sleep, researcher Matthew Walker, PhD, makes the following points. The shorter you sleep, the shorter your life. And that's based on 20 large epidemiological studies with millions of people. Heart disease, obesity, dementia, diabetes, and cancer have all been linked to short or disrupted sleep. Missing just an hour or two of sleep in one night raises systolic blood pressure and heart rate. The yearly transition to daylight savings time from center time with a loss of a mere one hour of sleep raises heart attack rates and car accidents the next day. The extra hour of sleep transitioning back drops these rates on the day subsequent to the change. Sleep deprivation impairs sensitivity to the satiation hormone leptin and enhances the activity of the hunger hormone ghrelin, increasing appetite contributing to undesired weight gain. When dieting, sleep loss increases the amount of lean tissue loss rather than fat. When males sleep only 5 hours per night for one week, testosterone levels drop the equivalent of 10 to 15 years of aging. Sleep deprivation contributes to abnormal menstrual cycles and infertility in women and lower sperm count in men. If you squirt a sample of the common cold virus called rhinovirus up the noses of subjects, 18% will catch a cold when they're sleeping 7 hours per night. Those sleeping 5 hours or less have a 50% chance of getting a cold. Adequate sleep leads to a better antibody response. Sleep only 4 hours for one night and natural killer cells drop 70%, which has huge implications for fighting infection and cancer. Sleep deprivation shortens telomeres and are like the little caps at the end of shoelaces. Telomere shortening is a marker of enhanced aging. So hopefully these tidbits have convinced you of the importance of sleep. Dr. Walker, when interviewed on the Ritual podcast, has stated that he believes that sleep is even more important than nutrition for good health. Others would challenge that view, but needless to say, sleep is really important. There are a number of simple strategies to improve your sleep. Get up and go to bed at regular times, even on the weekend. Give yourself enough time in bed to get your requirement of sleep. You shouldn't need an alarm in the morning to wake up. Limit alcohol. Although it may relax you, it interferes with the normal sleep cycles, reducing the quality of sleep. I rarely drink, and that is one main reason why. Caffeine can be a problem. For many people, it takes six hours to clear half the caffeine in your system. Consume one cup of coffee at noon, and you may still have one quarter of the cup in your system at midnight. Make that two or three cups, and you will have even more in your system interfering with your sleep. Try confining caffeine intake to the morning, and if necessary, stop completely. Sleep in a cool, dark room. Get blackout blinds or use an eye mask. Exercise regularizes sleep, especially if done outside in the morning. Some people find that a warm bath in the evening is helpful. Paradoxically, the warmth draws blood to the surface of your body, causing cooling of your core temperature, an important physiological signal to initiate sleep. Here's a big one for some people. Turn off electronics in the evening. The blue light from screen stimulates wakefulness. There are blue blocking screens that can help with this. Just keeping the lights down low in your house can help if you have dimmer switches. Needless to say, what you're watching matters too. If you're staying up too late because you just can't stop binge watching Netflix, that isn't going to help. If you've tried all these strategies and you find that you aren't sleeping well, seek the help of a sleep specialist. I've had issues myself with non-restorative sleep with excessive daytime sleepiness for decades, and I've tried these strategies and many more. 
without benefit. I've had a suspicion for many years that I may have sleep apnea. Sleep apnea is a condition where you briefly stop breathing over and over again through the night, causing nighttime awakenings that you might not even recall. Over a period of about 15 years, I had three consultations with sleep specialists, and they were very doubtful of my suspicion, and they didn't think that a sleep study was worthwhile. I just didn't fit the typical profile of someone with sleep apnea that are typically overweight. I have since learned that there's much more to it than that, and I'm now kicking myself because I should have insisted on a formal study years ago. Anyway, I started with a new dentist recently, and even without knowing about my sleep issues, he suggested that I may have sleep apnea because I have wear in my teeth caused by grinding them at night, a symptom of sleep apnea. He arranged a formal sleep testing, and I do indeed have sleep apnea. It's mild, but I'd had this suspicion for many years. It's a long story that I will share with you on another video, but I have since been fitted for a special dental appliance, something like a retainer that I will use at night, and that should help. I should be getting it any day now. Apparently 80% of people with sleep apnea will never actually get a diagnosis and will suffer in silence. More to follow on this, but here's the moral of the story. If you suffer from excessive daytime sleepiness and you've tried all the strategies to get better sleep and they haven't helped, get tested for sleep apnea. Another critical facet of good health is strong social bonds. Joyce and I are not experts in this field, but we know that connection to friends, family, and within our marriage is what adds richness to life. You may have all of your health habits dialed in and a great career and plenty of money, but it can feel all rather empty without a special person in your life that makes coming home at the end of the day something to look forward to. Good health isn't just about feeding yourself good things. It's about staying away from harmful substances. Alcohol is ubiquitous in our society, and there's a false idea that a little bit is actually good for you. This notion has been debunked. There is no cardioprotective effect from alcohol, and alcohol has been causally linked to several cancers. I have seen more cases of livers destroyed by alcohol than I can count. In my previous job, several times per week, I would perform a procedure called a paracentesis, whereby I would drain liters of fluid out of the abdomen of people with liver disease, most commonly caused by alcohol. It also shrinks the brain, so much for the glamour of alcohol. Most importantly, alcohol brings out the worst in people. Alcohol intake should be severely limited. Some people shouldn't drink at all. We've all heard of the devastation of the opiate crisis and its obvious destruction. Another issue with drugs is the liberalization of marijuana laws that I fear may backfire. Yes, I get it that the prohibition strategy drives organized crime to meet a market niche, and I understand the rationale for marijuana transactions being transparent in a non-black market. My concern is that marijuana usage will be legitimized and therefore people will make the mistake of thinking it's okay. Marijuana has been linked to lung disease, addiction, stroke, and heart disease. Plus, modern marijuana isn't the stuff kids were smoking when I was in high school. The plants have been bred to have a much higher THC content. If you feel that life cannot be fulfilling for you without such substances, you indeed need to introspect on why this is so. This gets out of the realm of our expertise. Perhaps seek the help of an addictions counselor. It is great to be attentive to what goes into our body, but what are you putting into your mind? Are you all on a path of learning, engagement, and purpose? To make life worthwhile living, you need to find the thing or things that make time fly by, where you are in a flow state where you have no desire to be doing anything other than what you are doing in that moment. Long living populations typically engage in some form of religious practice. Religion can provide guidance on how we are to carry ourselves in the world. Regardless of what religion you may or may not adhere to, there's something to be said about humbly contemplating our place in the grandeur of creation. So there you have it. That is a summary of our template for health. Clean up your diet. At the very least, eat more whole foods. Eat more vegetables, reduce refined sugar and refined grains. For full points, eat a whole food plant-based diet, ideally with no junk food or animal products. Be physically active. To stay functional well into old age, adopt a rational strength building program. Throw in some cardio and a bit of flexibility work. Nurture your social relationships. Get good sleep. Deal with addictions. Have a sense of purpose and direction. Spend time thinking about your place in the grandeur of creation. Our gimmick for good health is that there is no gimmick, but there is definitely a workable plan. If you like this video, again, please like and subscribe and post a comment below.